Hi guys, and welcome to episode 0 of this Eye of the North Let's Play. So this episode is going to be going over what's changed in the world since the end of Nightfall. So Nightfall's happened and Eye of the North takes place, I think it's two years later on down the line, so lots of things have changed. And in the um, Eye of the North manuscript, which you can hear right here, uh, there's a lot of basically brief summaries about what's happened in the world. Um, the manuscripts are nowhere near as long as the other ones, so what I'm going to do in this episode is literally just uh, read them out. I figured, why not? Now, you might be sitting there thinking, what the hell? He's already done 20 episodes of Eye of the North. Why has he gone back to, to do an episode zero? And uh, you're right, I, I wanted to do this. I wanted to do an episode zero for a long time, but I just never got round to it, and I was reading some stuff earlier, and I thought, you know what? I'm just going to wing it. I'm just going to do it anyway. So, so yeah, this, uh, this episode is going to be basically me reading out what's happened in the world. Um... So uh, enjoy, just remember there will be spoilers, so if you guys haven't seen the other Let's Plays or if you haven't read a summary of those, then there will be spoilers here. But here we go, okay, so. Then and now. In the world of Tyria, landscapes are ever-changing. Ascalon, once a proud nation, has all but fallen entirely to the Char. Cantha's emperor has been saved. Abaddon has been defeated. With each new adventure, the world is reshaped by the brave deeds of its heroes. Okay, so part one is in Ascalon. The mighty kingdom of Ascalon has seen better days. Humbled under the relentless assault of the Char, its cities ruined, its population scattered across the globe, Ascalon has become a conquered and savage nation. Brave heroes have slowed but not stemmed the invading hordes of Char. A large military force under the command of King Adelburn continues to defend the nation from incursion, but they slip further and further south as their battle lines collapse beneath the strength of the Char forces. In these dire times, brave cadres of Ascalonians, among them the Eben Vanguard, have taken up the fight to save Ascalon from the Char and free it once more. These small units, made up of humans who have escaped Char enslavement, have slipped behind, and in some cases broken through, the Char lines. They harry the invaders and divert supplies and troops away from Ascalon, leaving the Char to gnash their teeth at human ingenuity and perseverance. Okay, so that's Ascalon. Uh, Kryta. The White Mantle suffered losses when the Veil of Godhood was lifted from their so-called deities, exposing the Mersart as powerful yet mortal creatures. The revelation of this manipulation and deceit fueled a revolt in Kryta, led by the Shining Blade, and Kryta fell into civil war. The strongest force for unification, the Shining Blade, are scattered and losing power, forced to deal with too many enemies at once. It has become Blade against Mantle, Royalists against Warlords, all fight one another for control of Kryta. In an attempt to find a way to turn the tides of war in their favour, both the Shining Blade and the White Mantle have sent agents across the reaches of Tyria, searching for powerful allies or magics. Each side has vowed to bring peace to Kryta, no matter the cost. Okay, so those are the two remaining human Tyrian nations. Of course, Ore has completely been sunken and destroyed. So let's go see what's happening in Cantha. The defeat of Shiro Tagachi ended the plague that had afflicted Cantha. However, it took adventurers and members of the Imperial Guard a few gruelling years tracking down all of the afflicted and the remnants of the Shuriken army that the betrayer had unleashed in his final attempt to destroy the Empire. Over the past few years, life has begun to spring up in the Echo Vowed Forest as many areas have seen new growth take hold. Some even claim to have seen a change in the Jade Sea, small pools of water forming or even waves moving beneath the frozen surface. But these reports are unsubstantiated rumours at best. Kaineng still struggles under the burdens of bureaucracy, overpopulation and crime, and the Kurziks and Luxons remain locked in a never-ending battle over scant resources. Xingji Island remains an oasis of pristine valleys and beautiful vistas. Monks come to the island regularly for scholarly pursuits, while the general populace descends in droves for every festival held within the safe confines of Xingji Monastery. Commerce returned to a brisk pace once the affliction ended, and since then many Canthans have sought to re-establish old trade routes to Alona and Kryta, as well as locate new opportunities farther north. However, recent reports of earthquakes and giant cracks opening in the middle of urban Cantha have some believing this time of relative peace and prosperity has now come to an end. Okay, so now for Ilona. The land of the Golden Sun has weathered a long night and lived to see a new dawn. 
It has been nearly three years since Varish Ossa's reign of terror nearly unleashed Abaddon upon the world, and the effects of that event still resonate throughout all three provinces. Corner, home of War Marshal Varish, was perhaps hardest hit in the aftermath. In addition to the Dark Lord's nightmares, which have yet to completely fade from the minds and memories of its people, Corner had to deal with a power vacuum after the loss of its leader and most of its military. The Sunspears, along with Morgan, an ex-general of the Cornan armies, proved invaluable to its recovery. Both Istan and Vabi fared much better after the death of Abaddon. The Istani, long supporters of the Sunspears, were lauded for the aid they provided in the campaign against Varish. Attendance at Kamadam festivals has seen a marked increase as people from across the world come to the Sunspear homeland to pay their respects. In Vabi, the three princes spread their wealth copiously throughout the province to heal any wounds to their vaunted architecture, as well as the rarefied sensibilities of their people. Annual performances of Norgu's Nightfall in the Boca Amphitheatre draw huge crowds, if not rave reviews. All of Elona has also prospered from increased trade with Cantha and Kryta in recent years, and many Elonians have begun travelling the world for both pleasure and adventure. But as word spreads of strange rumblings from beneath the ground, adventurers are likely to return to Elona to investigate. So that's uh, basically the human world after these three years have passed. We've also got a little bit of information about the Great Dwarf, who will play a big role. Um, the Great Dwarf was featured heavily in my Sorrow's Furnace episodes, which I'll put an annotation to. And we also get a bit of information about the depths of Tyria. So look at, let's look at this. So here's a quote from the Tome of Rubicon, which we found in those episodes. The Great Destroyer has been cast down into the depths. Never again shall its name be uttered, lest it rise up and bring ruin down upon the world. Okay. So every dwarf knows the tale of the Great Dwarf and the Great Destroyer. Whilst most dwarfs with any spiritual leanings still believe their race was forged upon Anvil Rock by the Great Dwarf in an age before men, few actually put much stock in the myth of a titanic struggle between their dwarven deity and a mystical creature of vast destructive power and limitless evil. That all changed, however, when the Tome of Rubicon, an ancient dwarven artefact supposedly created by the Great Dwarf himself, was found buried deep within Sorrow's Furnace. After quashing repeated attempts by the Stone Summit Dwarves to retrieve the Tome and call forth a Great Destroyer, High Priest Alcar led a group of excavators into the rubble of the Stone Basilica to bring the ancient relic home. In his translations, Alka has found the tome contains more than just an account of the earliest days of the Dwarven race. It also provides specific details about a final conflict between the Dwarves and minions of the Great Destroyer who will swarm up from the bowels of the earth and spread across the world. The battle between the Great Dwarf and Great Destroyer is fated to play out once again, it seems. The tome does not foretell the entirety of the outcome, nor predict a victor. It only mentions that the Dwarves will be forever transformed by this battle. Okay, and lastly, the depths of Tyria. The Dwarves have provided limited information about the mysteries they uncovered beneath the Earth. Initial reports describe an immense, interconnected underground complex they call the Depths of Tyria. These natural caves and excavated areas house structures left behind by civilizations dating back to a time before the arrival of humans on Tyria. The Depths are connected by a series of magical gateways that allow swift travel through miles of earth and stone. These gateways were created by a race known as the Asura, who used them for mining, research, and other jaunts across great distances. Most of the gates are guarded by Asuran golems, for the depths teem with threats, both animal and geological. Those who dare to travel below realise the risk they take in doing so, and those who return tell wild stories of monsters made of fire and stone that move through the depths. So there we go. That's that's not the whole manuscript, guys. There is a lot of other, other information in here about characters we're going to meet. Some characters we've already met, in fact. Uh, but these will appear in the video descriptions, if not read out loud, of the episodes where we meet these characters throughout the Let's Play. So, uh, so yeah, I hope you guys are already... Oh, there's even information about enemies here. That's pretty awesome. So, yeah, um... This will all be in the Let's Play in the descriptions, as I said. So I hope you enjoyed this episode, guys. Bit of a weird one, I know. Uh, and I will see you for episode 1, or episode 21, depending on when you're watching this. Um, so yeah, catch you later.